Central Church, living the gospel of Jesus Christ, being God's love with our neighbors in all places. Joy at Central is being together for friendship. And being together for fun. Joy at Central is caring for one another. In the home or in the hospital. Central is a place that you can call home. Where everyone has a place. And there is a place for everyone. 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 Central Church, across from the Cider Mill in Endicott, serving around the world. Please stand as you are able, so that we might share in the responsive call to worship. It's printed in our bulletin. The Creator has planted seeds in all of us, May we nurture good deeds and loving kindness. Jesus calls us to bear spiritual fruit. May we bless and build others in the realm of God. The Holy Spirit moves in us, encouraging us to grow. May we be nurtured, may we be blessed, and may we grow to bless others. Please be seated. We'll begin our announcement period this morning with two minute speakers. First, Kelly Devine, and then Bill Carmine. Well, good morning, Central Church. How are you? You guys having a great summer? Right? Here we go. <laughs> All right, so we've got picnics, we've got family vacations, warm weather, and August is just around the corner. So as you can see, I brought a prop. <laughs> First, I'm going to define the word hero for you. A hero is a person of distinguished courage or ability, um, admired for his brave deeds and noble qualities, and he or she is a person who, in the opinion of others, is regarded as a role model. Now, both of the events that I want to talk to you about today have to do with heroes and role models. Our fifth annual free carnival, our neighborhood carnival, that we try to pull in people from all over the neighborhood to interact with us, that's going to be held on August 23rd from 3 to 7. Now, you're saying, that's a ways off. Well, I got to tell you, it's going to go by fast, and there are things that I need from you guys. This year's theme is going to be the Heroes Tour, obviously. <laughs> and um, we would like uh, to have you guys help us support this going forward. If you would like to donate supplies or you would like to work, I have all the information outside the church office. You'll see outside the church office, we've had our education committee has done a lovely job. There's a, it looks like a building with a lot of little windows. The little windows are post-its and on them are all the supplies that we need to make this happen. We want to keep this a free event. We want to be able to have people from the neighborhood come and have not only food with us, we're going to have free music, we're going to have the zoo mobile, there are so many things we're going to have the kids be able to, and adults, interact with us. Uh, so, I would like anybody who wants to donate supplies out in front of the church office, take one of the little tags, bring everything back by August 17th, which is a Sunday, and label it Carnival. That's not all. If you always wanted to work in the Carnival, <laughs> but you have other jobs, uh, you can volunteer. And there's a list of <clears throat> whether you have one hour available that day or you have the whole day free and you're going to donate it to, to our event, you can help, OK? There are, there's a list of jobs. You can pick your job. If you don't care what job, just write that down too. But sign up. Come help, because it's always a really good time. And Horace? We're, I just had to mention this, we're going to have cotton candy too. <laughs> oh. 
So donations of time and supplies are needed to make the event happen, and I'm really, I would love it if you would stop and sign up. Secondly, on, on a more serious note, August 2nd, which is really, literally, a couple weeks away, we are, for the fifth time, going to participate in Broome County Council of Churches' Ramp It Up program. We are going to set yet another person who cannot leave their home, we are going to set them free by building them a ramp. I heard from Ron Wensinger the other day, the ramp is going to be in Whitney Point, so it's not too far away. The date is August 2nd. I have, I'm still looking for some youth to help. I've got a, a good number. Uh, need a handful of adult mentors. Mentors actually, if you're good with tools or you just want to supervise the youth, we don't expect the adults to do the bulk of the work, but this is a youth initiative. This is something, if you are looking for a way to bridge the gap between us more seasoned people <laughs> and the youth, this is the perfect project, okay? So if you want to learn something from them, you want to teach them something, um, stop by the church office outside, you'll see, I need application because they do background checks on adults and the kids have to fill out one too. So I just want to say thank you in advance for all of your continuing support that makes Central a joy to be a part of. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Now, I know that all of you out there aren't going to be heroes. And I want to, and when you're a hero, you know, you just get a nice smile for whoever you are being a hero for, or a letter in the mail, maybe. But I've got something where it's gonna, I'm going to give you some nourishment. Absolutely, next Saturday, for $5, you can get a soon to be famous pulled pork sandwich made by Art and he's sitting right there with a great big smile and he just can't wait to go out there and get that pork and take those pigs by, you know, I'm gonna take, he said, I said, who's gonna pull the pork? And you know what? He says, you and I. And he says, I'm gonna pull from the front and you're gonna pull from the back. from the back and you know what he said he says after an hour of pulling I can guarantee you two things are going to happen and I says yeah what he says we're going to be tired <laughs> <laughs> and also we're going to have all the things needed for this pulled pork sandwich on Saturday uh, we got 50 tickets sold that means there's 50 people I know are coming and I know there's more than 50 people out there so before you leave on the way out Bob Oney's going to sell tickets over there, and I'm going to sell tickets over there, and you can be guaranteed for $5, you're going to go away with nourishment in your stomach. Here are just a couple other program notes. Just a reminder that this coming Wednesday, uh, July 23rd at 6.30, it's going to be a, a bunch of folks gather over at Chuckster's Golf uh, facility over in Vestal. And if you are one of the ones who'd like to participate in that, in fact, like all are invited to that. If you'd like to participate but don't have a ride, please call the church office and we can make arrangements. Also in your, bullet, in your packet of materials this morning, there is a small ticket regarding the blood drive coming up next Saturday. We'd like you to pay particular attention to that because so often in the summertime, the supply of blood runs pretty low. So if you are available to do that Saturday morning, you can uh, uh, do that from uh, 8 until 1 p.m. And then there's a slight overlap there with the pulled pork sandwiches. You can get re-nourished in addition to the free breakfast that you would get for donating blood. So Saturday could be a big day if you plan it right. Looking more to the future, next Sunday there's going to be that uh, two cents a meal deal a collection that we've done uh, once a month. It's going to be coming next Sunday. And that's the uh, special offering essentially that supports our Shepherd's Supper program. The idea was that if you would just put two cents away for every meal that you eat, chances are by the end of the week or the end of the month you'll have a significant uh, collection of change and if you would uh, choose to donate that to the Shepherd's Supper program we would really be appreciative of it. Also in August, um, Kelly Devine, in her many roles as a super lady, is now uh, 
taking on the, the periodic challenge. We had a bunch of folks two years ago and two years before that who were trained in CPR and use of the uh, automatic external defibrillator. And basically any of us who were trained two years ago, our certification is now gone. So if you want to renew your certification, that opportunity is now offered. Uh, there will be classes taught uh, during, this, during August. There are a number of sign-up dates in there in front of the church office if you'd like to, to sign up. The basic cost of that uh, program is $25, but we have one anonymous donor who has already said that they would be glad to support as many as four persons who felt that the $25 was difficult, the cost will be cared for. So if you'd like to learn CPR and learn how to use the AED device, we invite you to come to Kelly's class. We'll turn now to our first scripture reading of the morning. The Old Testament reading is found in Psalms 139, verses 1 through 12, and 23 and 24. It can be found in your pew Bible in the Old Testament on page 577. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand will, shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Please remain seated, and now let us join together in the unison prayer that is printed in our bulletin. Holy One, we come today to worship you in this holy time and in this sacred space. Open our ears to your word, our eyes to your wonder, and our hearts to your spirit of love and grace. There is much we need to learn and we wait for your teaching. There is much we need to do, and we wait for your guidance. There is much that gets in the way, and we ask for the wisdom to identify it. You are the light for our path, the strength for our souls, the journey of our life, and our eternal home. We offer ourselves to you and your will, all in Jesus' name, amen. Here, sorry, <laughs> I surprised myself. Children, come on forward for children's time. You guys are ready, aren't you? Let's see. Nobody else today. Nobody else today? Oh, come on. Anybody else today? Hi, bud. How are you? Yeah. Well, let's see. I have a bag today. Is either one of you a farmer? Are you a farmer? Mm, no. You're Daniel. Okay. I'm not a farmer either. I kind of do this for a living, right? So, but I got, but I have some seeds here. I have some seeds. You see these? Yeah. Do you know what kind of seeds those are? Sunflower seeds. You are so right. Those are sunflower seeds. That's a sunflower seed. There's a whole bunch of them. So if I wanted to make sunflowers grow, what would I do with these? Put them in the ground. I would put them in the, I would put them in, would I put them in? 
Oh, I'd put them in dirt? Yeah. So if I had some dirt here. What? What? I got a bag of dirt. That's like a two-year-old's dream, isn't it? <laughs> it's dirt. You smell it? It's dirt. Mmm. Mm. Do you want some? That smell? Take a smell. No, not a finger. A smell. That's dirt. That's nice, rich dirt. So, so I have to, I have to, you dump know what, I'm just, I have to dump it in there? Yeah. Tell Mr. Greg not to look if I get dirt on the rug. <laughs> All right, so I, I put the dirt in here, right? Yep. Okay, so I have my dirt. Hmm. Now put a seed under the Now put a seed in there. Do you want to put a seed in there? Yeah. All right. You want to put a seed in the dirt? Here. Can you get that? All right. Stick it in there. All right. So what else does it need? Water. It needs water? Huh. What else does it need besides water? It needs water. Hmm. It needs water. Oh, another seed. There we go. Mm -hmm. So it needs water to grow too, right? Yep. Well, I think I'll water it later. I'll get some more seeds. Nope. That's it. That's all the seeds. There's one we dropped. So it needs water. What else does it need? Sunshine. Sunshine. And see, I think you really are a farmer. You must, you know all this stuff. Liquid right there. I'm not yeah. a farmer, but I... But you know how to plant a seed. You know what? I think we all do. We all kind of know what a seed needs to grow, don't we? I grow the vegetable garden in my yard. You have a vegetable garden? That's pretty awesome. Mommy, have so a I... vegetable garden yeah. and a cucumber. There's a cucumber in your garden? No, we have a mommy. Oh, I see. Okay. In mommy's garden, there's a cucumber. Well, we're going to see if we can grow a sunflower, okay? So I'll water it later. When we plant things, we have to take care of them, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't not water. You have to water them, right? And you have to let the sunshine get to them, right? If I put this, if I put this in a closet somewhere, is it going to grow? A dark closet? Yeah. No. If I don't water it, is it going to grow? No. No. You have to water it. You have to take care of it, don't you? Yeah. Jesus tells stories about seeds and planting seeds. And I know how to do it. I'm yep. Well, we are going to listen today about Jesus telling us stories about planting seeds and growing things. Okay? Can you listen to the story when it comes about growing things? Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming up. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Join together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this beautiful day. For all the hearts and friends and family gathered in this place for this time of worship together. We thank you for all that you bless us with every moment of every day of our lives. Help us in those days when we miss it. Help us to see what you've planted in us. Help us see the ways that you are nurturing us and growing good things in us. Help us grow into the people you've called us to be, full of love and grace. Help us to be in ministry, in our families, in our community, in our world. Bring your love to life through the work we do with our hands and our hearts. As we touch those on our prayer list, those in this church family who need love and care, who are facing struggles of one sort or another, bind up their wounds, heal their loneliness, give them courage and strength, for whatever they're facing. And in addition to all that, fill us with enough compassion and enough care that we can add to their healing and increase it.
We come to you today listening for your word, listening for your life, eager to grow, eager to live into your grace and glory. We ask all these things today in the name of Jesus the Christ as we offer to you the prayer he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, who chose to live among us, you remind us that in your creation, both good and evil exist side by side. We know that the evil can come in subtle ways, valuing the regard of others more than seeking to please you, putting self-promotion before compassion for others, or turning a blind eye to injustice. May the gifts that we give this morning be our affirmation that we will choose the good over the evil and to choose what serves your loving purpose over what denies it. Help us to bear fruit and may our lives be deemed worthy at the time of harvest. We pray in the holy name of Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament. It's the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. It's coming from the Message Translation. He told another story. God's kingdom is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. That night, while his hired men were asleep, his enemy sowed thistles all through the wheat and slipped away before dawn. When the first green shoots appeared and the grain began to form, the thistles showed up too. The farmhands came to the farmer and said, Master, that was clean seed you planted, wasn't it? Where did these thistles come from? He answered, Some enemy did this. The farmhands asked, Should we weed out the thistles? He said, No, if you weed the thistles, you'll pull up the wheat too. Let them grow together until harvest time. Then I'll instruct the harvesters to pull up the thistles and tie them in bundles for the fire. Then gather the wheat and put it in the barn. Jesus dismissed the congregation and went into the house. His disciples came in and said, explain to us that story of the thistles in the field. So he explained, the farmer who sows the pure seeds is the son of man. The field is the world. Pure seeds are the subject of the kingdom, the thistles are the subjects of the devil, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, the curtain of history. The harvest hands are the angels. The pitcher of the thistles pulled up and burned is a scene from the final act. The son of man will send his angels, weed out the thistles from his kingdom, pitch them in the trash and be done with them. They are going to complain to high heaven, but no one is going to listen. At the same time, ripe, holy lives will mature and adorn the kingdom of their father. Are you listening to this? Really listening?
Some of you know that story as the wheat and the tares, especially if you're very familiar with the King James Version of the Bible. It's an old word, tares. Peterson uses thistle. Other translations use the word weeds, plain and simple weeds. What Jesus is talking about when he talks about whatever these things are is a kind of weed particular to his area found in the Middle East. Scholars think it was, it was a plant called the bearded darnel. It has no virtues, this plant. Its roots grow and surround the roots of good plants, sucking up precious nutrients and scarce water and making it impossible to take it out without taking out also the thing you've planted in the first place. Above ground, it looks identical to wheat until the seeds come. And those seeds can cause everything from hallucinations to death. Nice plant. So now that you know that, see, now, now you can go out and be a biblical scholar and tell everybody what that means. Here we are straight into another parable of Jesus this week. Summer seems to be parable season. One thing we have to know about the parables is that when you read them or hear them, you are hearing something that's very contextual to Jesus' time, very particular to his audience. A parable is like a joke. It's not a joke. It's like a joke in that if you have to explain it, you haven't told it right, and it's no longer a parable. Those listening to Jesus would have gotten this one immediately. We don't, exactly. But just because we don't understand the agriculture of it all, just because most of us don't speak farmer every day, maybe most of us didn't know until just five minutes ago exactly what kind of weed he's talking about, doesn't mean that the point he's making is any less important. This story is a story about the persistence of evil and the response the righteous are called to make. It's an eternal punchline, an eternal trope for you literary types, good versus evil, right versus wrong, and what is supposed to be done about it. There was a day in living memory of most of you, some of you, when good and evil seemed easy to spot. You know, especially in the movies. White hats, black hats, the sheriff is the good guy, the bandit's the bad guy. You knew the players because they wore the hats, right? Bring it to the next generation, good and evil for another generation, the Cold War. That was classic, good versus bad. The US, good, USSR, bad. James Bond was the good guy, everyone who spoke Russian was bad blow up the bad guys pretty spectacularly and walk away coolly with a cigarette. At the, end of the at the end of the day, the world is safe for democracy until they need bond again. Now, frankly, I don't mind Sean Connery making the world safe for me. That's okay. I'm good with that. I think that's beside the point. Or bring the whole good and evil trope into the next generation. Good and evil face off in Star Wars. The evil empire and the scrappy alliance trying to keep the galaxy safe from the forces of evil itself. Remember Star Wars, right? You could tell the bad guys there too, though they wore black and white. But you could totally tell by the theme music. <laughs> or by Darth Vader. <sighs> you knew bad was in the room when you heard that. It was the eternal engagement of the forces of good and evil with a soundtrack. Or the next generation, the, the story continues for my children, the Harry Potter cycle. An entire generation has grown up in a Harry Potter world. Yet as different as the setting is from the ones before, it's the same story, it's the same punchline <clears throat> for a generation that lives in very different times than even 40 years ago. I hate to break it to you, Star Wars was 40 years ago. We live in a time where it's really hard to sort out good and bad. 
where our understandings of good and bad are forever shadowed by the destruction of two towers in New York City. We don't have a Cold War to reference. There's no evil empire, communist or galactic. We live in a time of terrorism, where evil acts come out of nowhere. And there's no easy way to identify who will do what or when. It's not as easy as black hats and white hats anymore. It's not even as easy as those some would like to make it so. It's not as easy as Islam versus Christianity or Democrats versus Republicans. People want to make it that easy, but it's not. You don't even get theme music as a clue anymore. What strikes me about the Harry Potter stories, going back to Harry Potter, is that J.K. Rowling is basically telling Jesus' story. She gets that it's not always easy to tell where good stops and evil begins. That, in fact, both are everywhere at the same time. Voldemort and Harry, on the surface, pure evil and ultimate good, but each one is part of the other. If Voldemort destroys Harry, some part of him must go as well, and it's even true in the reverse. Some part of Harry will disappear when Voldemort does. Different characters in the story don't really help in figuring it out either. If you've read these stories, and if you haven't, you should. They're great. Severus Snape, whose side is he really on anyway? Nobody knows. He seems to be playing both sides of the battle, and you're never quite sure of him. Draco Malfoy, hijacked by tradition, torn two directions. Sometimes you can't really tell where he's at either. You can't tell who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, and who's just working for the highest bidder. It reflects our times. But it's the same question. What is good supposed to do when it's confronted with evil? It's the question Jesus is trying to answer. But I think his answer goes even deeper than the question and answers another one. What do we do when we find both good and evil together? In systems and structures, in politics and principalities, sometimes we can recognize the good and evil in them without too much trouble, though different people have different ideas about the nature of both. And how do we know how to tell? You know, we've grown expert at drawing enemy lines between the distinctions we've made. We're good at choosing camps, picking sides, and staying on our side of the battle lines. How do we choose the good? What do we do with the bad? Do we destroy it? Do we blast it into infinity? Do we legislate against it and enforce it by the rule of law? The force of might? What do you think Jesus' answer to that would be? There is a problem, and I think Jesus is getting at this. There's a problem when the good or the righteous, even those who are right, try to take matters into their own hands. When they try to pull out the weeds so the wheat can live uninterrupted, you know, clearing out the bad so the good can have all the light and the sunshine and the nutrients and the water. The reality is, and I I think this is what Jesus is trying to say, is that it is nobody's business but God's. What we can take from this story is an essential truth for the people of faith. When we believe ourselves to be right, and then on the strength of that belief, we begin messing with things that do not belong to us, such as decisions about other people and judgment, and exclusion, and battle lines, and enemy camps. When we start messing around with those things, we cause harm, not only to others, but to ourselves as well. And that's the part we most often miss. 
We get busy trying to identify the problems with others. And I don't not only miss where we've created harm, but where we've caused harm to ourselves. Jesus' punchline to this story is that judgment, even righteous judgment, is completely self-destructive. The parables, old and new, woven around this one in the Gospels, tell us that with patience comes grace, with grace comes the chance to change, with change comes the chance for redemption. When we short-circuit those possibilities and we begin to sort out the good and the bad according to our own standards, we've become the bad guys. We've begun our own destruction. What are we supposed to do with all that? It feels like it puts us in a corner. Because if we can't make judgments, where does that leave room for fighting for justice? Where does that leave room for social action? What happens to the righteous anger that changes the world? Are we just supposed to sit there and let evil grow? Because it sounds like Jesus might be saying that by telling the story of the farmer leaving the weeds to grow in with the wheat. It seems to me that what's asked of those who would be fruitful for God is to provide all the conditions in which good can grow. Love, tolerance, patience, forgiveness, mercy, justice, grace, peace. Those are the sun and water and soil in which good things can grow and bear fruit. It's our responsibility as God's people to provide all that. To be all of that in the world. Where those things don't exist, we're to put them in place. Where they've been taken away, we are supposed to fight for them. And at that point, when we've done all that we can do to bring the things of God to being in the world, we've done what we're called to do. What comes of that work is none of our business. If evil sprouts, we're to be vigilant in making sure that good thrives too. We do our work and the rest is God's work. But there's one more thing if we keep playing with this story, this metaphor of the weeds and the wheat. It seems to me that if we think about this problem of good and evil and where we find them and what we do about it, that there's another question here as well. What do we do when we realize that we have both? within ourselves. You see, I think that question could be also the point of the parable. I think it's even harder to answer, but it seems to me that the answer is the same. We make sure we've prepared a place for the good to grow, for God to grow. And we will find in time that the evil will fall away when we have nurtured our relationship with God until that is what we're made of, there will be no room for anything else to grow. The weeds that creep in will starve for lack of attention. What God has planted in us will flourish. Simple, but not easy. That is harder work than identifying what's good and evil outside of us and going to battle against one or the other. But we are called to be faithful. We are called to be fruitful. We are called to sow seeds of love and justice and peace within ourselves and in the world. The rest belongs to God. Anything else is not our business. I think that's great good news. Thanks be to God for it. Amen.